Hello friends, welcome to One Academy. Let's crack neat PG. I'm Dr. Shonali Chandra and in today's session we'll be talking about the treatments methods for the infertile couple. I have highlighted my reference code here which is S-H-O-N-A-L-I. So if you decide to take a plus subscription from the Unacademy platform, you can use this referral code to avail a 10% discount on your subscription package. You can also download the Unacademy learning app. Uh, it will help you uh, make your journey easier. You'll get uh, daily notifications regarding the upcoming sessions. Uh, you'll also get daily live classes on the platform where you can you know, chat with your educator, interact, ask your doubts and queries and get them solved there and then. So it's like a live classroom experience. Uh, the courses are structured, keeping in line with the latest NEAT PG syllabus. There are also live tests and quizzes on the platform, which will help you evaluate your performance as you go along. And most importantly, one-time subscription gives you an unlimited access, so you can watch all the live sessions from all the faculties who are active on the platform. And even if you miss out on the live sessions, you know, you can always go back and watch the recorded versions from the company comfort of your own devices. Uh, top educators are associated with the platform. All subjects that we need to prepare for the post-grad entrance examinations, they are covered. And every now and then, uh, comprehensive batch courses, as well as short duration crash courses, they keep getting launched. So you can check out the ongoing courses in the platform as well. And now there is a new module of subscription, which is the Iconic subscription, which allows you to access an academy and prep ladder at the same time. Now you can take this Iconic subscription for 12 months, 18, 24, for a 36 months duration and if you subscribe using my code that is s-h-o-n-a-l-i you can avail a 10 percent discount on your subscription package as well and talking about the various NEAT PG Plus subscription modules, well, there are many. You can choose one depending on your needs and requirements. So if you're targeting the upcoming exams and want a crash course, you can take the one-month or three-month duration subscription. Uh, for example, if you're targeting the next exams, uh, then you can take the longer duration subscription package of 12 months. It will uh, give you enough time to go through all of the sessions and will leave you time in the end to revise as well. And as you can see, it turns out to be more economic economical also in the longer run and for those of you who want a slower pace of preparation like you're in your third year or final year MBBS or you're working simultaneously so you're juggling hospital schedules clinics classes duties all together at the same time you can take the 24 months duration package it turns out to be far more economical in the longer run and if you subscribe using my code that is s-h-o-n-a-l-i then you can avail a 10 percent discount on your subscription package as well. Uh, once you're on the platform, do check out the uh, special classes which I've already taken on the platform. There are various plus courses on the platform for which you'll have to subscribe. Uh, there's a capsule course on reproductive gynecology, on high-risk pregnancy, in gynae oncology, as well as on labor and its complications. And an upcoming uh, capsule course, uh, it's a plus course, is coming up uh, starting tonight, 21st of December, timing of all sessions at 8 p.m., so there are four sessions in all uh, today, to, I mean tonight and then on tomorrow, that is 22nd December, then 23rd and 24th, where I will be discussing ultrasound diagnosis of pregnancy, prenatal and euploidy screening, a detailed discussion on abortions, on ectopic pregnancy, as well as on molar pregnancy. So that's the upcoming plus course, which begins tonight, friends, and four sessions in all back to back, same time, 8 p.m. So coming back to the session at hand for today, so uh, let's get started without wasting any further time and let me see who has joined in. So what are the treatment methods which are available for the infertile couple? Now over the last two sessions, we have already discussed uh, the various uh, causes of infertility, right? We've also discussed how we evaluate for infertility in an infertile couple. Now let us see that once we do find the cause and once we've completed our evaluation, what are the various treatment methods for an infertile couple. I mean, I will be talking in this session about ovulation induction, about intrauterine insemination and IVF, in vitro fertilization. I'll be focusing on the very basics of where these uh, treatment modules are applicable and what is the basis of these treatment modules. So good evening, Dr. Zebunisha. Welcome to the session for today. 
and let's get started. Now, once we talked about the causes of uh, infertility, we realized, and this is where we ended our last discussions, that we can have female causes, we can have male causes of infertility. Uh, among the female causes, we can have ovulatory causes, tubal factor infertility. We might find uterine factors contributing to infertility or cervical factors could be there. I mean, a routine clinical practice, we're not uh, necessarily always evaluating for cervical factor, but we do check the basic infertility workup involves the uh, husband semen analysis, involves testing for ovulation, involves testing for tubal factor infertility and getting a basic uh, outline of the uterine lining and, you know, assessing for the uterine factors as well. Now, talking about the ovulatory factors, the treatment is uh, straightforward, simple. We can try ovulation induction in these cases, right? And if there is a uterine factor for infertility, like for example, if you identify Asherman syndrome or you identify submucosal fibroid which is contributing to infertility, those structural causes need be treated. So your treatment will be directed towards the treatment of cause initially, right? So good evening, Aisha. And good evening, Dr. Sanam. Welcome to the sessions for today. So you guys have joined me earlier as well in the previous sessions. So we were talking about the overview of treatment options. Right. Now, moving on further, if you have a tubal factor, yes, of course, uh, while discussing the tubal factors earlier, we discussed that we can try for a tuboplasty surgeries, hysteroscopic cannulation and everything. But if you do agree on this, that and if the tubes are, you know, quite damaged and, you know, they're blocked completely, then in vitro fertilization is the best option uh, that is there for tubal factor infertility. Now, once we've tried ovulation induction for a couple of cycles, most of the times we're trying for three to six cycles, this ovulation induction. If it works fine, if it, the woman conceives fine, if it, she doesn't conceive after going through a couple of cycles of ovulation induction, then the next uh, step in the treatment option is ovulation induction plus intrauterine insemination right and this is again tried for another three to six cycles right and if it works fine if it doesn't we're left with no other option but to go ahead with in vitro fertilization for the cervical factor yes of course if there's a cervical factor like for example if there are anti-sperm antibodies then we don't have any specific treatment of uh, you know a very good treatment for these anti-sperm antibodies and we begin the treatment with ovulation induction plus IUI in these cases. And if you talk about the male factor infertility, now yesterday we talked about the evaluation of male factors and I told you that there can be mild abnormalities in the semen parameters for which most of the times no cause is found, right? So in cases of mild abnormalities of the male, one can simply go ahead with intrauterine insemination. And if there are severe abnormalities in the male parameters, one has to go ahead with IVF, in vitro fertilization. So this is the broad overview of the treatment options. Now let us talk about them one by one, right? Now let's... Uh, Let's talk about further about intrauterine insemination before we go on to talk about ovulation induction separately. So what is intrauterine insemination? Intrauterine insemination, where we take the husband's or partner's semen, right? And we wash and prep that semen. We wash and prep it up, right? And thereafter, about 0.5 of that, 0.5 ml of that washed and prepped semen sample here is injected directly into the uterine cavity bypassing the cervix, right? So that is intrauterine insemination, okay? Now, one thing that you have to understand here, this washing and prepping of the semen is required. It is a very essential step. I mean, you cannot take directly the semen and without an wash, washing and prepping it up, you can't introduce inside the uterine cavity because once we talked about how fertility takes place in the first session, we talked about how, you know, the uh, sperms need to reach the uterine cavity and during that process, you know, capacitation takes place and, you know, uh, uh, the uh, 
capacitation is required as a major step, which although begins in the cervix, major the major portion takes place in play takes place in the fallopian tubes. And other than that, the semen needs to be washed and prepped for reasons that you know the uh, cervical uh, mucus also prevents the abnormal sperms from ascending upwards. So that's why we need to choose the best performing sperms for intrauterine insemination. Right. So how do we wash and prep the semen up? I mean, there are various methods of sperm uh, preparation which are utilized. And a simplest concept is the swim up method. Right. So we take the semen sample in a test tube. Right. And then we centrifuge the semen sample. OK. When we centrifuge it, what happens is that the most motile ones, the most motile ones in that semen sample are going to swim up. So this supernatant which will get collected will have the best sperms. Technically the best sperms. Why? Because the ones which are the most motile, the ones which are morphologically normal will be the ones which are most motile. So the morphologically normal, the motile sperms are likely to swim up. Right. So we will choose these best sperms for intrauterine insemination. So we want the best of the lot. So swim up method can be used as a sperm preparation technique. Other than that, you can use the density gradient method. Right. So the semen sample is here in taken in the test tube and uh, there are various culture media that are used in the uh, along with the semen sample there. So there's a different density of gradient uh, in that uh, culture media. And it's just a more, uh, you know, better method, much better method of a sperm preparation as compared to the SWIP method. So SWIP method is the simplest method and your density gradient method is a better method for sperm preparation techniques and yes of course there are other methods like glass wool filtration method the logic of using these sperm preparation methods is to choose the best performing sperms right now once they are chosen they're put inside the uterine cavity and we bypass the cervix altogether so this is the basic of intrauterine insemination now the question arises what are the various intra uh, what are the various indications for IUI and MCQs are often framed around this topic, right? So they'll give you a couple of options and they will ask you whether it is an indication for IUI or not. So this is a very frequent MCQ that is asked in the exams. Now, what are the indications? Let's go by them one by one. Like we discussed in the overview section, we discussed in the overview session that we've been trying ovulation induction and it's not working. So if ovulation induction by itself is failing, we can add ovulation induction plus IUI to the treatment protocol. Why is that? Because when we are doing IUI, we are bypassing the cervix. And in evaluating infertile couples, we are not testing for cervical factor. And in IUI, we are anyways bypassing the cervix. So if ovulation induction alone fails, we can use IUI as subsequent method. And IUI is not done alone. It is always ovulation induction plus IUI, which is done, right? The second indication would be a mild male factor infertility. right? Now, just like I described the top uh, described IUI to you, we choose the best sperms. Right. So if there is a uh, has, if there is a partner, if there's a male who has mild factor infertility, I mean, mildly reduced uh, sperm concentration, uh, you know, mildly reduced motility or mildly uh, reduced uh, um, normal morphological form. So mild male factor infertility, what we can do is when we do the sperm prep preparation, we get the best performing sperms. And by doing IUI, we put them inside the uterine cavity. So half the job done. I mean, we just help the sperms a little. We say that we say, say to the sperms that, oh my God, you have to, you know, traverse the uterine cavity and climb up. Let me put you inside the uterine cavity itself. But the rest of the journey, the sperms will have to do on their own. That means reaching the fallopian tube and then fertilizing the egg inside the fallopian tube. So therefore, it is very, very important when we are doing IUI in these two indications, it is very, very important to note that the fallopian tubes should be patent. They should be patent, they should be open and they should be functional, right? Because in IUI, we are only bypassing the cervix. The job of fertilization will be done inside the tubes negotiated by the egg and the uh, sperm on their own.
Now, moving on further, what are the other indications of IUI? I mean, this is plain and simple. This is plain and simple. What are the other indications? So anybody going ahead and uh, filling my chart for me, what are the other indications of IUI that you know of? Right? Anybody? So we have retrograde ejaculation. I mean, ejaculatory dysfunctions. You see, when you have to bypass the act of coitus altogether, when you want to bypass the act of intercourse altogether, we can go for IUI. So if there are ejaculatory dysfunctions in the male, sexual dysfunction, impotence, then you can go for IUI. If it's unexplained infertility, I mean, you evaluated completely and you found no cause. If you found no cause, what can you do? In cases of unexplained infertility also, the treatment begins with ovulation induction plus IUI. Aisha rightly saying cervical factor infertility is also going to be treated with IUI. But always IUI has to be combined with ovulation induction for best outcome and best results. I mean, nowadays, uh, IUI is never done in spontaneous cycles. When we are doing IUI, we always combine it with ovulation induction as well. And the other very, very important indication, IUI with donor sperm. Let's say there's a male partner who has completely no sperms at all in his semen sample. And he is absolutely incapable of conceiving the male partner. Then in that case, we can use donor sperms. And when we are using donor sperms, we can simply wash and prep those donor sperms in a similar manner and do IUI in the female. So IUI with donor sperm is also a valid indication of going for IUI. So these are the indications of IUI you should must remember. Now, another MCQ that is asked in the exams very often is, is IUI an ART procedure? Is intrauterine insemination an ART procedure? Now, what is ART? ART stands for Artificial Reproductive Techniques. Artificial Reproductive Techniques or Assisted Reproductive Techniques. So yes, I want to know from you guys whether you think IUI is an artificial reproductive technique or not. Yes or no. Aisha, you're saying yes. Anybody disagreeing with that? Anybody disagreeing with that? Is IUI an ART procedure or not? IUI by definition is not an ART procedure. It is not an ART procedure. Why? Because ART procedures requires by definition when the ovum, when the egg is manipulated outside the body, whenever the egg is manipulated outside the body, that by definition is an ART procedure. So IVF, in vitro fertilization, where we take out the eggs from the woman, that is an ART procedure. But in IUI, we are not taking the eggs outside the body. Therefore, ART by definition is not an artificial reproductive technique, right? So you guys often get confused in that option in your exam. So ART is not an artificial reproductive procedure because the egg is not manipulated outside the body. Now, moving on further, let's talk about this mild male factor infertility. I mean, you did, you guys did not question me regarding what this mild infertility is, right? You guys didn't question me what this mild male factor infertility is. Well, there is no technical definition as to say how much uh, infertility, how much, uh, you know, abnormality in the semen sample would be regarded as mild male factor infertility. But it is generally accepted that if the final prepped semen sample, okay, if the final prepped semen sample has a total motile sperm count of more than 10 million and has at least more than 14% normal morphology, then it gives the best outcome. It gives the best outcome, 
right so therefore when the final prep sample contains even less total motile sperm counts even less morphology one doesn't think that iui is the good choice of treatment one goes for the ivf in those cases so that is one data which i need you to remember right so there is no absolute recommendation regarding what is mild male factor infertility but it is generally accepted that if the final prep semen sample has a total motile sperm count of more than 10 million and at least 14% morphology which is normal it gives the best outcome that is possible right more than 10 million could be 15 20 50 25 ml so more the final prep camp sample counts the better the outcome right now moving on further let's talk about ovulation induction in detail now what are the an ovulatory disorders i mean ovulation induction is used for the various types of an ovulatory disorders like pcos which is the most common indication of using ovulation induction right so what are the various categories of ovulatory disorders so we can have the group 1 type of anovulatory disorders which is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism that means ovulation is not happening because of deficiency of gonadotropins here here is the problem at the level of the anterior pituitary hypothalamus so when there is deficiency of gonadotropins right the fallopian the ovaries are not going to get stimulated isn't it because it is the fsh and the lh which are leading to the growth of follicles inside the ovaries and which are leading to the ovulation that is lh hormone right so there can be group 1 of ovulatory disorders which is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism then we can have the group 2 of anovulatory disorders which are eugonadotropic eugonadism where your hormone levels are all normal where your hormone levels are all normal a classical example of group 2 anovulatory disorders is pcos in pcos the estradiol levels are also in the normal range the fsh lh are not deficient so that's why it is eugonadotropic eugonadism right and then you can have a group 3 kind of anovulatory disorders where anovulation is happening because of failure of uh, growth of follicles by themselves at the level of ovaries which is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism so there is estrogen deficiency that's because the growth of follicles is problematic and because of estrogen deficiency there is elevated fsh and elevated lh hormones you recognize this condition do you recognize this condition this can be seen in cases of premature ovarian insufficiency a woman who is aging right could be in a premature ovarian insufficiency phase and that is why she is not having uh, ovulation so there can be group 3 of anovulatory disorders and then there can be group 4 of anovulatory disorders which are clubbed separately hyperprolactinemia and we've discussed this again and again that increased prolactin levels by whichever cause i mean the etiology of increased prolactin could be different but yes increased prolactin is going to cause inhibition of the gnrh hormone production and that in turn will lead to decrease gonadotropins and that in turn will lead to an ovulation so these are broadly your four categories of ovulatory dysfunctions now why did i give you all this basic information about an ovulatory disorders because the drugs that you use for your uh, ovulation induction will depend upon what kind of an ovulatory disorder it is so when you have to go for ovulation induction with pcos like in those cases where your eugonadotropic eugonadism is there the drugs that you use are clomiphene citrate the drugs that you use are clomiphene citrate the drugs that you use are letrozole initially these are your first line drugs otherwise you can also use gonadotropins eventually if your clomiphene citrate and letrozole is not working or it's not acting right or it is not effective so in cases of pcos these are your drugs 
But very, very important to note here in a case of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. One very, very important thing to note is if there is already a deficiency of gonadotropins or already a deficiency of GnRH, then you cannot use clomiphene citrate or letrozole. That is a very, very important MCQ, my dear friends, that you cannot use your clomiphene citrate or letrozole in cases of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism where you will have to use either gonadotropins or you will have to either use pulsatile GnRH, pulsatile GnRH therapy for ovulation induction. Okay, so if primarily there is deficiency of gonadotropins, you're going to give gonadotropins from outside, right? If the GnRH is the problem, you can give the pulsatile GnRH therapy. What about in group 3? If there is premature ovarian insufficiency, a woman is going towards premature menopause, going towards ovarian failure. Can you use any of the ovulation induction drugs in this situation? Can you use any of the ovulation induction drugs in this situation? If a, you have identified a woman with infertility and she's already going into premature ovarian insufficiency, unfortunately, you can't achieve ovulation induction with any of the treatment methods. So there are no drugs here for premature ovarian insufficiency which can induce ovulation. And in the case of group 4, hyperprolactinemia, you will use bromocryptine. You will use bromocryptine for or cabagoline, that is your uh, dopamine agonist drugs, to induce ovulation. I mean, bromocryptine and cabagoline, they are not uh, directly ovulation induction inducing drugs, but they actually normalize the prolactin levels. They normalize the prolactin levels and therefore they resume the ovulatory cycles. They resume ovulation, which was blocked because of increased prolactin levels right so in a case of hyperprolactinemia if you have to induce ovulation then your first line treatment is bromocryptine or cabagoline and Aisha rightly saying somebody who has premature ovarian failure or premature ovarian insufficiency will eventually have to go ahead with taking eggs from somebody else that is omum donation so broadly, these are your drugs which are used for anovulatory disorders. We can use clomiphene citrate, letrozole, gonadotropins, pulsatile GnRH therapy. But important to understand is that in group 1 disorders, you cannot use clomiphene citrate or letrozole. In group 3, nothing works. And in group 4, where hyperprolactinemia is the cause of anovulation, you will first treat the hyperprolactinemia by bromocryptine or cabagoline and that will resume ovulation in majority of the women. Now, moving on further, let's talk about the mechanism of action of these drugs. So talking about clomiphene citrate particularly, since this is the most commonly used drug, this is the most commonly used drug and we've been using it for a long time. We've been using it for decades now. So there's a long data regarding the effectiveness and the safety profile of this drug. So clomiphene citrate is a non-steroidal selective estrogen receptor modulator. It is an SCRM. And the main anti-estrogenic isomer in clomiphene citrate is N-clomiphene. So clomiphene citrate has two isomers in that compound, right? An anti-estrogenic isomer, which is N-clomiphene, the other one is trans-clomiphene. So N-clomiphene is the main agent. Now, moving on further, I told you that it's most commonly used. There's a lot of safety profile data available. So women can be rest assured that using this drug to conceive will have no teratogenic side effects on the fetus, will not increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy also. So it's quite safe in that regard. So clomiphene citrate is the most commonly used drug. Now, talking about its mechanism of action, to appreciate the mechanism of action, you just need to go back and revise what happens in a normal menstrual cycle. 
You see, in a normal menstrual cycle, each month, there is growth of primordial follicles. These are the primordial follicles which are getting recruited into the menstrual cycle, right? Now, these growing primordial follicles, the follicles are surrounded by granulosa cells, right? So, these granulosa cells start secreting estradiol. Now, in the initial time, in the initial time, in the early first few days, what happens is that the estradiol is increasing in secretion, in amount in the body, but it is still in small amounts. It is still in small amounts. So that small amount of estradiol actually causes a negative feedback on the pituitary. Negative feedback on the pituitary. So these primordial follicles, the growth was happening in response to follicle stimulating hormone. The follicle stimulating hormone was recruiting these primordial follicles into the menstrual cycle. A couple of them would get recruited. And initially, estradiol gets secreted in small amounts and that causes a negative feedback on the pituitary. This is a very, very important negative feedback because then there would be a decreased amount of FSH secretion that would happen. And that decrease FSH that happens because of this negative feedback is very, very important because not all of these follicles will become the dominant follicle. Like if 10 cycles are in that race of ovulating, only one will eventually ovulate. So there has to be selection of this dominant follicle. So even though in the early part of the cycle, the FSH starts to decline, even then the dominant follicle continues to grow. The dominant follicle is that follicle which occupies or which attains the maximum FSH receptors. So it is able to sustain its growth even though the follicle levels are actually starting to decline in the early part of the cycle. So this growing dominant follicle secretes more and more increasing amounts of estradiol. Now such increasing amounts of estradiol actually then cause a positive feedback on the pituitary. So estradiol in small amounts, negative feedback on the pituitary. And estradiol in high amounts is going to cause a positive feedback on the pituitary. And now because of a positive feedback on the pituitary, what we get is an LH surge. What we get is an LH surge. And it is this LH surge which triggers ovulation, which triggers ovulation right so we get an estradiol peak and then we get an LH surge which triggers ovulation after ovulation what remains behind is the corpus luteum now this corpus luteum is secreting huge amounts of progesterone now these rising progesterone in the second half of the cycle are actually going to cause negative feedback on the pituitary negative feedback on the pituitary and therefore further growth of follicles is disrupted and prevented right now what will happen when there is going to be a normal demise of this corpus luteum a time will come here the corpus luteum has a lifespan of only 10 to 12 days this corpus luteum is going to die eventually there will be no progesterone coming from this corpus luteum so in turn there will be progesterone withdrawal when there is progesterone withdrawal, this negative feedback on the pituitary is lifted off. This negative feedback will be lifted off and that will result in fresh FSH being synthesized. Fresh FSH rise being synthesized and that will restart the fresh cycle. So this is what happens in a normal menstrual cycle. Are we clear on this? Any doubts? This is a very basic information of what happens in a normal menstrual cycle. And we are now going to see how we can achieve ovulation induction with the drugs that we are using. They primarily have a similar mechanism of action with slight differences. So now let's talk about the mechanism of action of clomiphene citrate. Now going back to this diagram again, I would again like to emphasize that the important aspect of uh, normal menstrual cycle is achieving these feedback signals 
right? So the pituitary knows when to decrease the FSH production. Pituitary knows when to increase the FSH production. Pituitary knows when to give the LH surge. How do the pituitary know all this? Pituitary knows all this because it senses the amount of hormones in the peripheral circulation, the amount of feedback signals that the pituitary gets in return. How does the pituitary do that? Because pituitary has your, FS, uh, your estrogen receptors. So your pituitary gland has your estrogen receptors. These are the estrogen receptors which are going to sense the estrogen levels in the periphery. Right? So all the estrogen that is coming from the ovaries is going to act on these estrogen receptors on the anterior pituitary. Estrogen is going to sense what is happening in the periphery and then it is going to modulate its production of FSH and LH accordingly. Right? Now, what happens with clomiphene citrate? Clomiphene citrate is an anti-estrogenic action. Very, very important to note. You'll just have to give me a moment, guys. Okay, so coming back. So this clomiphene citrate is main important action is the anti-estrogenic action. It is the anti-estrogenic action which is responsible for its ovulation induction effects. Right now, again, it can be very confusing in the sense that you will think why anti estrogenic action is low going to lead to ovulation induction. I'll tell you very, very important to remember it is the anti estrogenic action of clomiphene citrate which is responsible, and that to the central anti estrogenic action. Central anti estrogenic action. So, clomiphene citrate is going to bind to these anterior pituitary receptors central at the level of the pituitary gland. So when your clomiphene citrate binds to these receptors, these receptors are blocked, right? So there is receptor blockage at the level of the pituitary gland. Now when there is receptor blockage at the level of pituitary gland, pituitary doesn't know what is happening at the periphery. Pituitary cannot sense the signals that are coming from the pituitary from the periphery. It doesn't know what is happening at the level of ovaries at all. It's like are the estradiol levels low? Are the estradiol levels high? There is no sensing by the pituitary at all. And therefore, it's like fooling the pituitary gland to believe that there is estrogen deficiency. Please remember, go with me here step by step. There is no estrogen deficiency. We are just fooling the pituitary into believing that there is an estrogen deficiency. That is what the pituitary feels because its receptors are blocked which sense the estrogen in the peripheral levels. And to counteract that estrogen deficiency, pituitary increases the FSH production. And it is this increase in FSH production that happens in the early part of the menstrual cycle that is going to promote follicular growth, promote follicular growth. So more follicles will be recruited into the cycles, more growth of follicles will take place, right? So this is how clomiphene citrate induces ovulation by increasing FSH secretion right and since you can see here that a number of follicles are going to grow not just one not just two a number of them and there might be more than one dominant follicle which can come okay so normal menstrual cycles one dominant follicle comes with clomiphene cited i can get two dominant follicles i can get three i can get four also so there the risk of multiple multifollicular development is there and therefore, the risk of multiple pregnancy also increases to about 7 to 10 percent. Important percentage to remember for your MCQ, guys. So, risk of multifollicular development is there, and therefore, risk of multiple pregnancy is also there in the range of about 7 to 10 percent, right? Now, the other important thing to remember about clomiphene citrate is the dose. Usually, it is used in a dose of 10 milligrams 
to sorry 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams per day dose is the usual dosages that are used the other important drug is letrozole now letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor right now what is aromatase job is what is this enzyme do this aromatase enzymes converts estrogen actually it converts your androgens to estrogens right now this aromatase inhibitor is going to inhibit the conversion of androgens to estrogens again creating an estrogen deficiency like state and therefore again the pituitary is going to sense this estrogen deficiency and in to counteract that estrogen deficiency it is going to lead to increased fsh production and this increased fsh is going to further drive the follicular growth faster and better so aromatase inhibitor can also be used for ovulation induction it works on the same principle it will increase the fsh production from the pituitary gland but the receptors are not blocked in this case the production of estrogen from androgens is slightly reduced and that is why the pituitary increases fsh hormone production now it is the drug of choice for ovulation induction in pcos women currently pcos women have more androgens in their system so it has been seen that letrozole is the best drug that is used for ovulation induction in pcos women right now moving on further the dosage of letrozole is lesser it is about 2.5 to 7.5 mg per day we should not increase this beyond 7.5 mg the maximum dose that we can use is 7.5 mg okay now aisha uh, you're very i asking a very right question will there be this real deficiency this deficiency is there but only as long as we are giving this drug we don't keep the giving the ovulation in drugs through in induction drugs throughout the cycle we only give this ovulation induction drug be it clomiphene citrate or letrozole we give it only for 5 days we give it only for 5 days so during those 5 days there will be a slight estrogen deficiency which will be very real but this increasing fsh whether by coming from letrozole or whether by coming from clomiphene citrate this increasing fsh drives more follicular follicular growth more follicular growth more estrogen production so any estrogen deficiency that is created is counteracted any estrogen deficiency that is created is counteracted also okay now moving on further let's talk about the gonadotropins as a method for ovulation induction right gonadotropins can be used in various forms so earlier the gonadotropins that were available were the human menopausal gonadotropins i mean they're still available they are cheaper alternatives and they are obtained from the urine of post menopausal women therefore they are called as human menopausal gonadotropins now these human menopausal gonadotropins they are a natural mixture of fsh and lh they are cheaper but they are a mixture of fsh and lh now the currently used gonadotropins in most of the situations especially in ivf in vitro fertilization we start started using recombinant gonadotropins now these are expensive injectables right but they are more purer forms they are the purer forms right so there is less protein contamination in these recombinant gonadotropins we can get pure fsh alone injection we can get pure lh alone injection as well right so now we are using these recombinant gonadotropins they are much purer forms but they are expensive and gonadotropins are given as injectables they are given as injectables your clomiphene citrate and letrozole were orally acting drugs tablet forms gonadotropins are injectables which are given by intramuscular injection right now when you are directly stimulating the ovaries with gonadotropins uh, 
the risk of multiple pregnancy is even higher because the chances of getting multiple follicles is even higher as compared to clomiphene citrate and letrozole. So the risk of multiple pregnancy with gonadotropins is about 30%. That is quite a lot as compared to letrozole and clomiphene citrate, right? And then, of course, you can have your GnRH analogs and we can use these GnRH analogs like luprolite for that matter which is a GnRH agonist. It is a GnRH agonist and we can use this in a pulsatile manner to induce ovulation because when used in a pulsatile manner it is going to stimulate the pituitary gland to release more FSH and LH. So these are the other category of drugs which you can use for ovulation induction. Now let me summarize this here for you. What is the protocol for ovulation induction? What is the protocol for ovulation induction to help you understand the whole thing better because Aisha you asked me this question when to start. So let's see here. The ovulation induction protocol talks about giving ovulation induction from day 9, day 5 to day 9 of the cycle. Okay. So we have to give this any time between day 5 to day 9 of the cycle. I mean, one can give it from day, uh, just a second. Yeah, one can give it from day 3 to day 7 also, but it has to be given for 5 days. It has to be given for 5 days, whatever drug you are using, be it clomiphene citrate, be it letrozole, be it gonadotropins, whatever you are using, you have to give it from day 5 to day 9 of the cycle and then you have to stop it. After that, you begin with the regular follicular monitoring like we discussed in the evaluation. So you have to track the growth of the follicle. So a dominant follicle will be seen or maybe two dominant follicles will be seen depending upon whatever drug you are using. The fact is that you will see a dominant follicle appearing and the size will become about 18 to 20 mm. A time will come that the size becomes 18 to 20 mm. Right, So from day 5 to day 9, you gave the drug. Let's say, for example, you started the regular follicular monitory from day 11. So day 11, you did a scan. Day 13, you did a scan. Day 14, also you did a scan. So you can do it daily or alternate day. And then once the dominant follicle has reached 18 to 20 mm in size, then after that, I can ask her to go for timed intercourse. I can tell her, now this is the dominant follicle size. It can rupture any time. So go ahead with your intercourse. So that is called as timed intercourse, right? I can also tell her that let me give an ovulation trigger. Let me give an ovulation trigger. Either of the uh, either of the protocols are fine. So ovulation trigger. Can anybody tell me what will be the ovulation trigger? What is the ovulation trigger that can be used? What can I do to give ovulation? I need to control it. I need to take the ovulation in my own hands. So in normal cycles, it is the LH hormone which is leading to ovulation induction, which is the commonly used ovulation trigger otherwise. Another hormone which acts like LH, which is that hormone which acts like LH? It is your beta HCG. We can give the beta HCG injection intramuscularly to trigger ovulation as well. Once we give the ovulation trigger, ovulation is expected to happen, ovulation is expected to happen within the next 36 hours, within the next 36 hours. So once I've given her the trigger, I can tell her that now is your time. Within the next 36 hours, you likely ovulate, right? So you can start having intercourse now. And yes, after a couple of days, I will call her again to make sure that ovulation indeed took place and then I can redo the ultrasound after a couple of days and look for the signs of ovulation that the fall dominant follicle has shrunken, it has now smaller in size, it has become crenated margins. So this we discussed in the uh, section on follicular monitoring as well last time. So this is the basic protocol of ovulation induction. Now, I wanted to give you a basic heads-on on this protocol for another reason. Let's say if I have to do now an ovulation induction plus IUI, okay? 
Now tell me, what should be the timing of IUI? This is when we are not doing IUI alongside. That's why I'm asking her to have intercourse. After giving ovulation trigger also, I'm asking her to have intercourse. Let's say now if I have to combine ovulation induction plus IUI, what should be the timing of IUI? Yes. What should be the timing of IUI in the sense that when should I be performing IUI? When should I be performing IUI? Basically, it should be done on the day of ovulation, isn't it? The egg survives and is fertilizable for 24 hours. So my timing of ovulation, uh, timing of IUI should be on the day of ovulation, right? Now, either I keep doing the ultrasound every day and then find that one day when ovulation took place. Now, ovulation could have taken place. She might just miss coming from an OP for a, for a ultrasound appointment, right? Then my timing of uh, ovulation uh, will be lost. Then how do I time the IUI? Yes, anybody, how do I time the IUI? Then the timing of uh, IUI will be 36 hours after giving the trigger. 36 hours after giving the ovulation trigger. Now, this is again an MCQ that is asked in your exams. What is the timing of IUI? Well, it makes sense that you have to do the IUI on the day of ovulation. If you're giving an ovulation trigger, you are expecting ovulation to occur within 36 hours. And therefore, if you've given the trigger, you will call her for IUI 36 hours later. So today I gave the trigger, I'll call her on day 3. And that same morning, I will do IUI. What, when will I prep the semen sample? When will I prep the semen sample? I will prep it the same day, the day I have to do IUI. So I'm doing an ovulation induction on the woman right? I call the woman and her partner back to the OPD again 36 hours after the trigger. In the morning, the husband will give the semen sample. The lab will wash and prep the semen sample up. It will be ready for me in a couple of hours and then I will do the IUI. On the day of ovulation, 36 hours after giving the ovulation trigger. So this is the basic protocol of ovulation induction. Like Aisha, you're asking, is giving this trigger mandatory? No, it is not mandatory. It is not mandatory. Like I told you, one can go ahead with the timed intercourse again, right? But once you are combining it with IUI, right? Once you're combining it with IUI, giving ovulation trigger makes more sense. Like I told you that what will happen is, let's say, for example, there are many situations which can happen. Like, for example, you know, I'm monitoring the follicular growth. Follicle has become 18 to 20 mm in size. I want to do an IUI. I, for that, I will have to call her every day to check. Today is the day that ovulation occurred. No, tomorrow, day after. Sometimes people also feel that it might you know, coincide with the Sunday or it might coincide with, uh, you know, when the woman might not be able to come for follow up. She says, you know, there is something in my family that I have to attend to. Can we adjust the timing of IUI? Then I say, OK, fine, I'll give you the trigger accordingly. And the day I give the trigger, 36 hours later, the IUI can be done. So that gives the uh, that makes the timing of IUI under the control of the treating physician. So giving the trigger is not mandatory, but yes, convenient. Okay. Aisha, yes, natural LH surge will also be there. Yes, natural LH surge will also be there. But it is, you cannot predict when the natural LH surge will be there. That's why we are acting when the dominant follicle is 18 to 20 mm in size. Because once the dominant follicle becomes 18 to 20 mm in size, your natural LH surge can happen that same day, tomorrow, day after. There's no way of predicting, right? So natural LH surge can also happen. And if that natural LH surge can happen, then obviously natural ovulation will also take place. So giving the trigger is not mandatory. That's why. And I described to you the situation why giving a trigger becomes more convenient. Okay. Now let's move and take up some MCQs which have been asked in the exams. 
Now, uh, the anti-hormonal substance which is used to induce ovulation is clomiphene, letrozole, bromocryptine or mifepristone. So while you're figuring out that answer, I'll just take up Sarah's this thing. What is the difference between the long and short protocols? Now, long and short protocols, uh, Sarah, they have got to do with ovulation induction uh, protocols for in vitro fertilization when we do controlled hyperstimulation of the ovaries all right so there you use long and short protocols where you have to go into the details of the various long and short protocols so your uh, short protocol will be when you give small days of duration of gonadotropin therapy in the initial part of the cycle beginning from day 5 6 7 8 9 it has to be done daily injections have to be given daily and ultrasounds have to be done daily and the basic long protocol would involve an ovarian suppression by gnrh analogs so the pituitaries are completely shut down so that is the long arm, right? We've given an ovarian suppression initially and then start stimulating the ovary. So that's the basic difference between a long and short protocol. Okay, Sarah, so we can come back to that again once I'm talking about IVF. Now, what is the anti-hormonal substance used to induce ovulation? So Nurel and Aisha are rightly asking, let clomiphene citrate is the anti-hormonal substance because it works by the anti-estrogenic action. All right, now let's have a look at the next question. A young couple is being evaluated for infertility. They've been trying to conceive for the past one year. The husband's semen analysis is normal. The woman is 25 years old. Her BMI is 30 kg per meter square. She has irregular menstrual cycles. Ultrasound shows polycystic ovaries. There's no past history of tuberculosis or PID. The pelvic examination of the woman is normal. Ovulation induction is planned for her what's the drug of choice what is the drug of choice to begin with clomiphene letrozole gonadotropins bromocryptine or metformin yes guys now suvarna you're asking me can we use a single injection of fsh See, the injection of FSH will start from day 4, day 5 of the cycle. And whether you need one injection, two injections, three injections, it will depend upon how your follicles are responding. It usually doesn't happen with a single injection, right? And you cannot give a very high dose of FSH to begin with. It is a trial and error method. You see, you begin with low dosages, see that FSH is acting, do if I do uh, ultrasounds daily to track the follicular growth and then adjust your FSH dosage and injection requirements. The goal is to achieve dominant follicles of 8 to 20, 18 to 20 mm in size. So usually not achieved with a single FSH injections. Usually more are required, particularly when you are using FSH injections. We don't begin with very high doses. We begin with lower dosages first. Okay, now what's the drug of choice? Yes, so uh, the drug of choice here is going to be letrozole now. Very, very important MCQ guys, the latest recommendation for ovulation induction in polycystic ovarian syndrome is letrozole. Clomiphene is good, it is safe. Agreed, letrozole is also good and safe. But when you talk about drug of choice, it has to be letrozole. You have to choose letrozole over clomiphene when answering questions and exams like this. All right. So drug of choice for ovulation induction in PCOS cases is now letrozole in preference to clomiphene citrate. Okay. Now, let's see the next question. Now, this is slightly tricky. Let's see. Let's trigger this out. Let's find this out. A woman who suffered from severe PPH and hypotension due to placental abruption in a Limpa, I have already discussed letrozole pharmacology in the previous uh, coming slides, the mechanism faction, where I told you that it's an aromat uh, aromatase inhibitor. 
Okay, so let me just deal with this question and I can take up further doubts from Limpa at the end of the session, Limpa. Now, a woman who suffered from severe PPH and hypertension due to placental abruption in a motor vehicle accident now has anterior pituitary failure. She wishes to have another child. Ovulation can be achieved by which of the following hormonal therapy? Yes. She has anterior pituitary failure. If you look at the clinical profile, she probably has she has Sheehan syndrome. She has Sheehan syndrome. We've discussed this under the heading of aminorias, right? Now, which of the following hormone therapy will be useful to achieving ovulation? Look at the goal. She wants to have another child and you want to induce ovulation. Low dose estrogen therapy, HMG injections, pulsatile GnRH, clomiphene citrate, or letrozole. What is this? This is your group one, right? Isn't it? There is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. She has anterior pituitary failure. She has pituitary necrosis, isn't it? She has syndrome, she has pituitary necrosis. Therefore, there is deficiency of FSH and LH hormones, right? So I told you in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, we cannot use clomiphene citrate and cannot use letrozole. Because these drugs, when you go back and talk about the mechanism of actions, right? Let me just go back. The clomiphene citrate and letrozole, they were working by increasing FSH production from the pituitary, right? If there is hypogonadotropic, if the FSH production is already low and deficient, or if there is already anterior pituitary failure, how will your clomiphene citrate and letrozole be able to increase FSH production from that pituitary gland? So that is why they don't work in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And Dr. Sanam, low-dose estrogen therapy, low-dose estrogen therapy is recommended for these women. I mean, she, they are hormone replacement therapy is recommended for these women in Sheehan syndrome, but they will not but for, you know, for the hormone deficiencies, not for inducing ovulation. I mean, if you're going to give estrogen therapy and if you are thinking that you can give those high estrogen levels and that is going to create an FSH uh, peak and, you know, LH surge, if that is what you're trying to think, then think that she's already having anterior pituitary failure. So no matter what stimulation you give to the uh, pituitary gland, the hormone production will not take place because there is already anterior pituitary necrosis. So I don't want to choose this option as well. I'll rule it out. Now, some of you are saying option number B. Some of you are saying option number C. I say the correct option is giving gonadotropins from outside, human menopausal gonadotropin injections. Because even if you give pulsatile GnRH, right, you're giving stimulation in the form of pulsatile GnRH, that has to act on the pituitary. Yahape, there is anterior pituitary failure. There is anterior pituitary necrosis. So, how will giving GnRH in the, in the uh, GnRH injections from outside going to stimulate FSH and LH production from a pituitary which has already failed because of anterior pituitary necrosis? Therefore, in this situation, pulsatile GnRH will also not work. And therefore, what will work is human menopausal gonadotropins, giving gonadotropins from outside. All right? Because no amount of stimulation that you're going to give can create FSH and LH from a pituitary which has undergone necrosis. Right? So, the answer here is option number B, therefore. Now, let's go ahead and talk about in vitro fertilization. So, we've talked about ovulation induction, the drugs that are used, under what circumstances, which drugs are preferred, 
right? We talked about how we combine ovulation induction with IUI. We talked about what are the indications for going ahead with IUI. I also want you to remember that IUI is always combined with ovulation induction for better outcome. Therefore, when you are doing IUI for unexplained infertility, it's always combined with ovulation induction along with it. That's why I gave you that entire ovulation induction protocol. Now let's talk about in vitro fertilization. Fertilization that is taking place outside the body in vitro in the lab in this petri dish that is in vitro fertilization. Right now, if you look at the basics of in vitro fertilization, you also have to understand you see here that there are many pellets. There are many pellets here. What are these many pellets? They're containing many eggs. Each of these pellets is, you know, we eat in at the center of each of these pellets, you keep an egg, and around that you place the sperms, right? So we are beginning with a number of eggs, right? We're not beginning with one egg, we're beginning with a number of eggs. So therefore, what I want to emphasize here is that we need not just one egg, two egg, three eggs to begin with, we want many. About 17 to 18, the more the better, right? So I need many eggs to begin with. So I cannot go for ovarian stimulation with using clomiphene citrate or letrozole. For in vitro fertilization, I want to achieve more ovarian stimulation. I want more number of follicles. Therefore, I need gonadotropins or GnRH analogs to begin with. So the first step is stimulation of ovaries, which we call as controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. I'm stimulating them more as compared to ovulation induction alone. When I'm doing for IVF, it is called as controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, which helps me get a number of ovarian follicles not one not two not three not four but the more the better 15 20 ovarian follicles in a single ovary multiple of them this is this one view you can see many follicles in the ovaries there after stimulation of ovaries what we give is a trigger to induce ovulation we give a trigger to induce ovulation and this trigger can be hcg injection or this can be your LH injection also. So that trigger is given. After that trigger, 36 hours after that trigger, ovulation is expected to take place. Now I have to take the eggs outside. So 36 hours after the trigger, I will go for retrieval of these oocytes. I will go for retrieval of these oocytes. Right? So I have to take those eggs out. Right. So trigger 36 hours later, I will go for the retrieval of oocytes. So a needle is introduced here. Can you see this? A needle is introduced in each of these follicles separately. This has to be done under ultrasound guidance. The woman has to be under general anesthesia. A transvaginal probe is connected with a thin needle, which is specially designed for the purpose of retrieval of oocytes, right? So that is achieved under ultrasound guidance and under GA. So once I retrieve these oocytes, you know, they will come in that uh, syringe. They will come in that syringe through that insufflation syringe, which is connected to the needle. And I'll get the follicular fluid along with the oocyte. I take that in a test tube. I give it to the embryologist who's going to quickly look up the contents of the tube in the microscope and will tell me whether or not at an egg has is there or not. So that is going to be done at the same time once the oocytes are retrieved. So I will get about 17, 18, 20, a number of oocytes are retrieved. And those number of oocytes that are retrieved are then fertilized with the sperm. Now who's fertilizing? The sperms are fertilizing on their own. All that we are doing in a conventional IVF all that we are doing in a conventional IVF is we are putting the OX and the sperms 
together. Okay, in a petri dish, in a culture medium, the rest of the communication, the sperms will have to fertilize the eggs on their own. All we have done is bypass the fallopian tube. They were egg sperms were not able to reach uh, the eggs the tubes were blocked so i have now taken fertilization outside of the body aisha why don't we allow ovulation to take place because i have to take the eggs i, I need those oocytes so that i can use them in the lab if i'm going to allow for ovulation to take place all those eggs will be released into the peritoneal cavity then how will i extract those eggs that will be wastage of the patient's money and time and wastage of all those eggs that i build up right so i need to retrieve them so that I can put them in the petri dish along with the eggs. If ovulation happens spontaneously, and that is a very sad thing to happen, patients will sue you for this, right? That you took my money, you induced, you stimulated my ovaries, and then you lost that opportunity because all that all these follicles ovulated and the eggs are released into the peritoneal cavity. Then how are we going to fetch those eggs from the peritoneal cavity, right? So after fertilization, the next step is that you will get a zygote. Now who is going to look up the zygote? Where are we going to find it? It is growing in this petri dish. It is growing in that culture media. It is growing in that culture media. These embryos, early embryos are with us in the lab. They're growing in a culture media. That's called as embryo culture. And an embryologist is looking up under the microscope and figuring out in which stage of development these embryos are. Are they healthy embryos? Are they good embryos? right have they become day one embryos have they become day two embryos have they become day three embryos have they become a morula have they become a blastocyst what have they become so that is what an embryo culture is so daily you know an embryologist is going to figure that out for me and after that the final step is embryo transfer once the embryo reaches the day three embryo or we can also do it in the day 5 embryo that is the blastocyst right doing day 5 embryo is better doing day 5 embryo is better that embryo is taken up and again it has to be put inside the uterine cavity so they are specially designed catheters which are available very thin very malleable which can be introduced into the uterine cavity and these small small embryos are going to be placed inside the uterine cavity that is embryo transfer after that these embryos will have to implant inside the uterine lining on their own I cannot help those embryos in implanting. So this is the basic outline of what is done in in vitro fertilization. Stimulation of the ovaries, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, retrieval of the oocytes, then fertilization in the lab, then embryo culture. Once the embryos are day three old or day five old embryos, they can be transferred back into the uterine cavity. Then the job of implantation is the embryo's job on its own right and day five embryos are better now i also want to tell you why we start with so many eggs i'll tell you why let's say for example we started with 18 to 20 follicles okay and then i did a follicular aspiration i was retrieving the oocyte out of these 18 to 20 follicles i was able to retrieve only 15 eggs I was able to retrieve only 15 eggs. So now I've got 15 eggs, right? And I made those 15 eggs. I placed those 15 eggs with the sperms to fertilize. Now, after that, I got, let's say, only 10 embryos. Not all eggs were fertilized. I got only 10 embryos. Now, out of those 10 embryos, let's say, let's say, uh, let's say three or four embryos died along the way. They became day one, but then they died. Some of them became day three. Some of them reached day five, but not all. So I was left with, let's say, only six embryos. Four died. So when I, there's a attrition at each level. That's why I want to begin with many follicles. All right. Because ultimately, I have to have a lot of healthy 
embryos, right? So six embryos I'm left with. It doesn't mean that I will put six all together at the same time. Nowadays, we are implanting one embryo. Single embryo transfer is what is being done in most of the circumstances, right? And one embryo is transferred. What happens to the five embryos? They are frozen for the next cycle. So that is what is done in in vitro fertilization. Okay. Now, moving on further, what are the indications of IVF? What are the indications of IVF? So one indication I already described to you, tubal factor infertility, right? When the tubes are blocked, then IVF is the only option. Right. And other than that, what's what else? Aisha, yes, there are special media for fertilization and embryo cultures. There are various medias that are available and there are various brands of medias available. They're very expensive culture medias. They have to store to stored at a lower temperature, you see. And therefore, uh, the entire process of IVF is very expensive. The drugs that are used are expensive. The, uh, the equipment that is used is expensive. The culture media that is there is expensive, right? Now, most of this culture media is going to take place, uh, see, it is going to replace uh, the uh, like I told you that in the fallopian tubes the secretions are rich in pyruvate so most of these culture media is going to take care of the proper amino acid concentrations in those culture media and they're going to provide good enough pyruvate and glycogen stores in the culture media which is going to nourish the early embryos right and Aisha rightly saying the next indication is a severe male factor infertility. Very good. So severe male factor infertility. If there are such low sperm counts and concentration that the sperms are so few in number, so, so badly immortal, you know, that they're not able to reach the fallopian tube. So, so I'll take them in the lab and I'll say now fertilize here. Now there's no need for you to climb up the, uh, climb up the genital tract. I've put you with the eggs together. So save your male factor infertility. Treatment failure right? Like you tried ovulation induction, ovulation induction plus IUI, nothing worked and then you end up doing an IVF, right? You can have unexplained infertility, very good Aisha, unexplained infertility. I told you that you do begin with ovulation induction plus IUI, but if it doesn't work, then yes, IVF is the next option. IVF with donor oocyte. Let's say for example, you have a woman with uh, this uh, a pre premature ovarian failure, a very poor ovarian reserve, and ovulation induction IVF is not an option for her, then she takes donor oocyte. Now, what do we do with the donor oocyte? We take the donor oocyte, take the partner semen, fertilize them, and take the embryo and put it in the patient's uterus. So, IVF with donor oocyte is another option. IVF with surrogacy. IVF with surrogacy. Let's, for example, a woman uh, has Asherman syndrome and you've tried all the treatment and everything. You've tried adhesive, so it's, it's not working. Her uterus is just unfavorable for implantation, but her eggs are okay, right? Then you can borrow the womb from somebody else. That is IVF with surrogacy, right? And yes, of course, Pallavi endometriosis, very good. Pallavi endometriosis. Endometriosis is one condition we discussed when the causes were considered that there can be, it can affect uh, fertility in ways more than one. So yes, with endometriosis, we try ovulation induction. We can try ovulation induction with IUI. If nothing works, we'll have to resort to IVF. So endometriosis is also one indication for IVF and Aisha very good PIGD IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis like for example the male and female partners they have an autosomal recessive condition they have a gene for an autosomal recessive condition which they can transmit to their child and it's a very dangerous condition and they don't want their offspring to have that same condition then what can we do we can do IVF because if you want to do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis before the embryo is implanting, then obviously the embryo should be with you in the lab so that you can check that embryo before implantation. So IVF has to be done if you have to go for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So these are broadly your indications for IVF. And I want to focus on this severe male factor as well. 
But before that, let me ask you this question. All of the following are indications for IVF except what is not an indication for IVF? We just went through a list of indications. So unexplained infertility, yes, an indication. Tubal factor, yes, indication. Oligospermia, decreased sperm count, yes, an indication. But prenatal, no. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. If you want to have a prenatal genetic diagnosis, then it is done before birth. It is done when the fetus is still in utero. So that is prenatal genetic diagnosis, which you do by all these screening methods and amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. That is prenatal. But it is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is done with IVF, not prenatal. For prenatal, you can do it once the embryo is there inside the uterus flourishing. Okay. Now, Sunum hydrosalpinx is included in all your tubal factors, right? So all your tubal factor infertility and compasses wherever the tubes are damaged for whichever reason. Now I said I will focus on severe male factor infertility. What's, what's a severe male factor infertility? Like for example, there is absolutely absence of sperms, azoospermia or severe oligospermia. Now it is very important to appreciate how IVF has revolutionized the treatment of severe male factor infertility. I mean, there was a time when men with azoospermia, absolute absence of sperms or severe oligospermia, like counts less than 5 million per ml they were they did not have a chance of having their own children but ivf has revolutionized their treatment also so now even azoospermic men or men with severe oligospermia can look forward for having their own children so when there is azoospermia or severe oligospermia one thing that we have to ascertain why this is happening why this is happening. So let's just go back on the causes of male factor infertility. I mean, most of the times, yes, we discuss it as idiopathic. You do you find nothing. But then there can be gonadal failure, right? There can be hypothalamic pituitary causes for the gonadal, gonadal failure. There could be obstruction to the outflow tract, which could lead to absence of sperms in the semen sample, right? I show medical treatment for male... It can be tried, but usually doesn't work. Usually doesn't work. So for you, like for example, as long as the male is not having gonadal failure, no, uh, then treatment can be tried like clomiphene citrate and, uh, and aromatase inhibitors. They have been tried in the male to stimulate uh, spermatogenesis, but that will work. Uh, only with mild factors in fertility. So that is not usually a very good modality of treatment, but it can be tried. Medical treatment can be tried, but as long as they don't have gonadal failure, right? So let's talk about azoospermia and severe oligospermia. So we have to go ahead with a hormonal profile first to find out what is the cause of this azoospermia. Like for example, if your hormonal profile shows that in the male, the testosterone is decreased and the FSH and LH levels are increased. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? If there is absence of sperms, if there is absence of sperms, in the semen sample completely and you did a hormonal profile of that male and you found that the testosterone is decreased and the FSH levels are increased, what does it mean? What could it mean? Yes, what could it mean? It would mean that there is gonadal failure, isn't it? It would mean that there is gonadal failure. The gonads, the testes are the site for spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis requires normal functional seminiferous tubules. They need certainly cells. They need the Leydig cells also because Leydig cells are your source of testosterone. And just like oogenesis or egg formation requires or follicular growth requires normal estrogenic environment of the ovary. Similarly, if you want to have a good spermatogenesis, then testosterone should be normal in amount. And the local concentration of testosterone in the testes should be normal. 
So if the testosterone is decreased and as a result of that decreased testosterone, the FSH has increased, that means the person has got gonadal failure. It's a testicular cause. Now, if you're identifying gonadal failure, then you'll have to find out why there is a gonadal failure. I mean, there could be Klinefelter syndrome. There could be Klinefelter syndrome and you will find that by going for a karyotype. So you will have to do a karyotype in a case of gonadal failure in a male with azoospermia. There could be Y chromosome micro deletions. I mean, these were the causes that we considered, right, in the last two sessions. So there could be a gonadal failure because of these reasons or simply because of a trauma or a radiation therapy. I mean, there could be n number of causes for this gonadal failure. And what if you found that the hormone profile showed that both testosterone and FSH levels are decreased? If your both testosterone and FSH levels are decreased, then it would mean, it would mean that your signal from above is not coming. Isn't it? That is why your FSH is also decreased. And because your FSH is decreased, that is why your testosterone is decreased. So if both of them are decreased, that means there is a going to be a pituitary or a hypothalamic cause. Now I told you that pituitary of the hypothalamic cause is the rarest form of male factor infertility. It is responsible in only about 1 to 2 percent cases. So we are less seldom we find this. We either find gonadal failure, right, or we find the other problem. What could be the other problem? The other thing that you can find is that all your hormones are normal. All your hormones are normal. Yes, Aisha, very good. Pituitary or hypothalamic cause in the male could be Kalman syndrome. Yes, it could be Kalman syndrome. Correct. And what about testosterone and FSH if they are normal? What do we find if your FSH and testosterone are normal? That means that the azoospermia is not because of gonadal failure. It's not because of any hormonal imbalance arising from the pituitary or hypothalamus, but it is possibly because of obstruction, right? So this is what we call as obstructive azoospermia, obstructive azoospermia. Now we have to find out the cause of this obstruction, right? So what we can do is we can go for a transrectal ultrasound. We can go for a transrectal ultrasound. It will be able to show us whether there is any obstruction, whether there is any obstruction in the outflow tract, right? Whether the obstruction is at the level of the ejaculatory duct, if it is at the level of the vas deferens. So wherever the obstruction will be, the part of the outflow tract above the obstruction will look dilated. Okay, so you will have, when you have an obstruction in the outflow tract, you will have the part of the outflow tract above the level of obstruction looking dilated on ultrasound. Or you could have a congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens, where when you do the ultrasound, you'll realize that there's no vas deferens. There is no vas deferens, right? So you can have a congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens as well. And there can be other causes of this obstruction. And one of the most frequent causes of such obstruction, if I tell you, would be sometimes, you know, males undergo vasectomy. Male sterilization, no? they undergo vasectomy. And at a later point in time, because of whatever reason, maybe they regret that decision or they marry somebody else, or it could be any of these reasons. They just want a reversal of the vasectomy. And vasectomy, you know, the vast difference has been tied and then if it is a vasectomy and the male wants a reversal of the vasectomy then that simply can be offered to that male so surgical correction of obstruction can also be tried i'm not saying surgical obstruction surgical correction of the obstruction cannot be tried it can be tried but yes if it doesn't work then what's the option if it doesn't work then the option is tahira rightly saying sperm retrieval Right? So that is what you're going to do. So if you talk about the management of azoospermia males, okay, then the management is all about getting as much sperms as possible. That is the goal. Right? And from where do we get those sperms? So if you talk about the management of azoospermia or oligospermia, the goal is to get sperms. Right? They might be there. 
above the level of obstruction or they might be there some of the sperms there in the testes which maybe i can use right so if you are go up extracting sperms in a case of obstructive azoospermia then i can extract the sperms from the epididymis right if the obstruction is at the level of ejaculatory duct vas deferens or anywhere else the epididymis is the site where the sperms are stored they gain their motility right so i can go for epididymal sperm aspiration right extraction i mean i can do that by microsurgical techniques i mean giving an incision on the scrotum opening up the epididymis and then you know these are microsurgery microscopic surgeries that's why microsurgical and then can pipette out the sperms or i can go for a percutaneous needle insertion and then i can extract the sperms and if it's a case of a non obstructive azoospermia non obstructive azoospermia would mean that there is gonadal failure there is gonadal failure like for example a person had history of some prior radiation or he had a crypt orchid undescended testes in childhood that was repaired and now his uh, uh, you know it's just gonadal failure has been recognized and his gonads are not producing uh, sperms in the required numbers they are not coming in the semen or they are coming in very small numbers then as a last resort yes i can try extracting as many sperms as possible from the testes directly right now we can go for testicular sperm extraction where you give an incision open up the seminiferous tubules pip it out the sperms or we can go for testicular sperm aspiration which will be a needle guided procedure so any of these procedures can be used for sperm extraction now the important point that i'm coming here is when you do get the sperms i mean there's no way of predicting how many you would get you want to get as many as possible now whatever you get once you surgically retrieve the sperms what are you going to do with those sperms there's a male who has azoospermia or severe oligospermia your goal was to get as many sperms you've retrieved them what next now so you talk about i told you ivf i told you ivf and i described the procedure to you where sperms and eggs were kept together and the sperms had to fertilize the eggs on their own that was conventional ivf now aisha rightly saying we'll have to go with ivf with icsi ivf with icsi icsi in the last decade or two has revolutionized the treatment of azoospermic males which we call as intracytoplasmic sperm injection right that is going to be your next step because the sperms that you have extracted be it from the testes or be it from the epididymis their motility will not be 100% so how can you leave them together hoping that these sperms are going to fertilize the eggs on their own right so if you're surgically retrieving the sperms you have to help them in another way you have to manually manually fertilize each egg with the sperm that is called as intracytoplasmic sperm injection which we call as icsi it is done by the embryologist under the microscope as you can see here a single needle needle which is as thin as the strand of your hair is going to pick up a single sperm and that single sperm is injected into the egg under the microscope this is icsi so what are the indications of icsi if they ask you in your exams and they do ask you the indications of icsi in your exams as well so the indications of icsi are whenever you are using surgically retrieved sperms the second is a severe male factor right so let's say for example you are starting for ivf for male factor infertility and the sperm count is already less than 5 million per ml or the motility is already less than 5% or less than 4% normal morphology such severe parameters then now with the development of icsi they are subjected to icsi directly ivf with icsi in cases of severe male factor or there can be previous failed conventional ivf i mean you've tried conventional ivf it's not failed it's got failed and then we resort to ivf with icsi so these are your basic indications of icsi right so this is about the 
discussion for today guys we've talked about the various treatment protocols methods which are available what you need to remember are the basics understanding of these methods and then once you basically understand what is happening in these methods you need to figure out which method is offered to which set of infertile couple okay so any further doubts and queries please feel free to ask me right now and uh, meanwhile i just want to inform you that you can check out the previous uh, special classes while you're on the platform you can also go ahead and have a look at the various plus courses on the platform subscribe to the platform using my code s h o n a l i which will help you avail a 10% discount on your subscription package there is a capsule course which is starting tonight from 21st december there are four sessions back to back and tonight in discussing ultrasound diagnosis of pregnancy and prenatal aneuploidy reading so you can join me there but that's a plus course for that you will have to subscribe for this case uh, for this discussion so thank you so much guys if there are no further questions i will be ending up the session for uh, uh, for today and in the next session i will be talking about mcqs on next youtube session mcqs on cin and cervical cancer screening that will be taken up next session it will be an mcq based discussion on a very important topic which is cir and cervical cancer screening so that will be on youtube uh, Uh, same time 4 pm so thank you so much guys